And I've made it probably halfway to campus and then realized that's really odd. Why is the stop sign on the other side of the road? Weird. It literally took me a a good 20 seconds when I stopped for the stop sign that's on the other side of the road to go, I've been driving on the wrong side of the road. G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm your host, Rob Mulkey, coming to you today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. I'm thrilled to have, as my guest today on the podcast, Eleanor Mitchell, who's the Director of Global Engagement at Charles Sturt University. Eleanor, thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Thanks so much for having me along, Rob. I'm coming to you today from Turbo Country up in Brisbane, Queensland. Really good to be here. Awesome. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. And You're going to say like, oh, shucks, no, that's not true. But this is totally true. You are one of the absolute super women in Australian international education. And I'm so looking forward to unpacking some of your stories and your tips and tricks and techniques. But I thought because this is an international ed podcast, we should start on something which is international ed. Obviously, study abroad and exchange is an important part of international education. And you had probably one of the more unique study abroad experiences that's possible. Yeah, most people probably think about England, Europe, Canada, but not you. Yeah, and look, I guess I was a bit of a serial study abroad student when I was doing my undergraduate degree. I did do some of those more traditional locations. I studied abroad in Australia. It was my first destination that I studied abroad. I did Spain as well. But the one that definitely shocks people is when I say that I studied abroad in Antarctica. Love it. Okay, how? You have to be like, well... (laughs) And so just for clarity, but like, so I was just telling Eleanor before we started recording, I was just having lunch with my wife before we started recording. She said, oh, who have you got on the podcast? So I said, Eleanor, oh, great, great. And you know, what story are you going to start on? I said, well, Eleanor studied abroad in Antarctica. And she went, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's lots of people's reaction. As far as I'm aware, it was the first ever study abroad program to Antarctica. So I was doing my undergraduate at my alma mater, the University of Georgia. And program came up for Antarctica and always up for a new adventure, amazing place to, to explore. It was an interdisciplinary program. So you could be from any major, any of the, the colleges uh, and weave it in as, as an elective. So I um, said, yeah, absolutely. And the majority of it was online studies during fall semester with guest speakers coming in from all over the globe, Antarctic research centers, specialists in Antarctic studies and flora and fauna and iceberg shelves, you name it. So it was a really you know, all-encompassing studies. But then it culminated over the Northern Hemisphere winter break, which is obviously summer in Antarctica, uh, with two and a half weeks on a expedition ship uh, going around the Antarctic Peninsula. We were a group of students from predominantly University of Georgia, but a few other universities from across the United States as well on this expedition ship with tourists as well. The ship only had around 100 passengers, so it was very small in the scheme of things. Obviously, going on the incredible adventure across the Antarctic Peninsula, but also getting to you know sit down and have meals with you know, there was a group of Germans, for example, that I remember having really you know engaging conversations with in the evenings. Um, a few Spaniards. I'd often find myself on the bridge, you know, well past midnight, still daylight, hanging out with the crew who was a mix of Europeans and Asians. So it was an incredible experience and and so diverse in terms of what we got to do whilst we were on the expedition itself. What did it feel like being there? Otherworldly. So it's one of those places that's really hard to describe. It's, yeah, it's coldest windiest, driest, most remote place on earth. But you have these moments of really feeling like you're in a total different planet. One of my favorite things to do is when we would do shore landings into penguin colonies was just to go find a quiet rock and sit and observe. And you'd just be surrounded by thousands of really smelly penguins, by the way. They look really cute, but they actually stink. The guano is horrific. But then just to be absorbing that, I was doing reporting while I was there for my undergraduate journalism degree I was doing. And so getting these sound bites of thousands of penguins squawking around you was really just otherworldly in the sense of going, is this actually, you know, on our planet? I have so many questions. Maybe the place I'd like to back up. 
I mean, you said this was like your, you've done multiple study abroads. So where did the curiosity come from? You know, where did your you know, desire just get so far outside your comfort zone come from? Yeah. So I certainly had, I, I think, been exposed really fortunately throughout my my childhood to getting to go on lots of incredible explorations, both within the United States in our back backyards in terms of family farms and just being able to to rip and rear and roam, going on family trips around America, as well as, as getting to go elsewhere. So certainly it had that seed planted during my childhood, but always had, had loved adventure, getting out and seeing somewhere new, realizing that there was so much more outside of Georgia, where I grew up in the Southeast United States, that there were so many other cultures and beautiful natural wonders that that were out there to be explored and, and how much, I guess, opportunity and growth could come from getting outside that comfort zone. But don't get me wrong, there are certainly moments on all of my study abroad programs and uh, certainly in places I've lived around the world that you have those comfort um, zones at the threshold. And it's a precarious place sometimes in terms of how much growth can come from being in those uncomfortable places, but not being, you know, totally overwhelmed and consumed by being in those spaces as well. Does one of those trips as a kid stand out to you? Can you remember when I say, okay, tell me about one of your childhood trips, which one first jumps to mind? Probably where we holidayed in the summers. We we joke that we just don't even share the name of it. It's grown a lot through the years, but uh, growing up, it was very much a middle of nowhere little beach community on the panhandle of Florida. And we would go down there and get to spend the summers, you know, going out, scalloping, fishing, sea kayaking. As I got older, doing things like scuba diving off shipwrecks, so really getting to explore and then the residual part of, of summer is weren't family holidays or adventures in the sense of we're going to go to this location to have an adventure. But summer camps in the United States for many kids is getting shipped off to an actual summer camp, you know, going off to, you know, a camp in the mountains and spending, you know, a month, two months there. Our summer camp growing up was going to the, the family farm to my grandparents who were still operating the family farm at the time. And we ripped and reared and kind of got to just explore and, and do whatever we wanted. But that certainly is is one of those things that really instilled a lot of that exploration and adventure at an early age. It's like the sense of freedom, isn't it? Just as you as you talk about the family farm, I can imagine how that must feel as a kid, you know, just running across a paddock somewhere. Go, like there's nothing holding you back. You can do whatever you want. You know, parents just let you out and you go crazy. And it's like that freedom just sort of sinks somewhere deep inside you, doesn't it? And just takes hold. Yeah, I think that's certainly a, an element of it. Mind you, my parents would probably argue to say that I'm the I'm the, the child who took it to the extreme, and the other child who grew up in the same environment hasn't gravitated that way. But it certainly took took hold in me. That's for sure. Isn't that funny? So let, let me jump on onto one of the other threads that sort of came out when you're talking about your study abroad experiences, because I'll get yelled at by someone from the audience at some point if I don't don't take you up because you're saying you're talking about being on the edge of your comfort zone and it sounded like there was like sort of a sketchy experience in there somewhere or a few sketchy experiences <laughs> you want to share on like something that uh, was well and truly on the edge of the comfort zone yeah look I think there have been um so many it's probably a, a matter of of which one I'll I'll give you one from Antarctica I can give you give you heaps but one of those in, in Antarctica which was definitely on the, the edge is one of the iconic things that you often as a adventurer in Antarctica have the opportunity to do is a polar plunge so the water is there below freezing due to the salinity it doesn't actually freeze it at zero at 32 and so the traditional method is taking a zodiac doing a shore landing and then running in from the shore into the freezing water submerging yourself and then running out before you get totally frostbitten and and wrapping up the shift that i was on we were scheduled to do that at a place called deception bay which is an old historical whaling station a bit buffered from the weather unfortunately the seas were so rough that we couldn't actually do shore landing safely but of course when you've got a, a ship full of travelers from around the world including some university students who were very passionate to be able to do this polar plunge our captain thankfully was uh coming up with alternative solutions what became the the opportunity to do the polar plunge was the gangplank to the ship was lowered to sea level and we were advised that if we wanted to participate in a polar plunge, we would individually have the opportunity to go down the gangplank and jump off the gangplank 
into the ocean and then come out. I'm not sure in hindsight, and now that I'm responsible for risk management of sending our domestic students overseas, that that was necessarily all that safer than just taking the Zodiacs onto shore, but something dictated that it was a better option for all of the, the ship participants. And so never one to miss out on something. I was, of course, yep, I, I'm in. But then there's that moment of standing there on the side of the ship, waiting your turn. You've got a, you know, guys had on, you know, swim shorts, girls had on bikinis, and then we had on our massive insulated, you know, down jackets over the top of that. But then when it was your turn, you're stripping off your massive puffer down jacket and running down this gangplank in what you should actually be wearing to the the beach in summer and jumping off the gangplank with icebergs floating past you, literally small icebergs floating past. And there are these two burly shipmen standing there. They're in full winter gear. They've got on beanies, head to toe, Antarctic expedition gear, waterproof boots up to their knees, and they're standing on the edge of the gangplank then when you reemerge to yank you out back onto the, the gangplank. Of course I did it and had an amazing time, but there is that moment of trepidation of going, wow, this is really intense and I'm going to jump off. And what happens if I don't just pop back up and suddenly I'm floating away with that iceberg? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Like I've been in really cold water before, like water with ice in it and that sort of thing, like frozen river in Tennessee in the USA, actually. And uh, it's funny how the psychology of jumping in is so much harder than once you're actually in. Everything goes numb almost instantly, doesn't it? It's so cold. Once you're in, you, you couldn't stay for a little bit, but it's that the the psychology piece of it. And I think that's certainly been, I would say that that comfort zone, so much of it is you know, mental and, and psychological in terms of letting ourselves go to that um, edge of comfort zone, which is where the, the growth opportunities can come from. But it can be very uh, disconcerting, the the mental and psychological process to let yourself go into that space. We're definitely going to talk more about that. I'm really fascinated by some of your opinions and thoughts on how, how to take that on. But I wanted to pick up the thread around study abroad first and foremost, because you're sort of saying like, well, we never get away with that stuff you know, these days, which is so true. I remember the early 2000s, we're just you could really just do so much more fun stuff. But from a risk perspective, it was a, a little bit a little bit crazy. And I mean, travel has changed a lot, hasn't it, in, in that time, not just in terms of study abroad, but in general. So what have been some of the big changes in your mind? Yeah, look, I think that's one of those is so much of where we're at right now has drastically changed in, in the past 20 years. A huge component of that is, is technology without question. If you think back to the study abroad programs that were happening in the, the late you know, 90s and, and early 2000s, we didn't have smartphones that not only was a program you know, leader or a faculty leader carrying around, but every single student having one in the palm of their hand. So when they need to be at a location, it's just, well, I'll just chuck that into Google, Google Maps. Obviously, there are some massive benefits that come from that. Obviously, huge one being student safety, you know, now students have an app on their phone. We can immediately, if they haven't ghosted us on their geo tracking, we can pinpoint to, you know to what was their you know most recent location that they were physically at. If we need to, to you know verify their safety or if there's a critical incident in the location, so some incredible benefits that come out of it: safety, security, well being, holistically, and obviously risk mitigation. But I think there's some elements of that exploration, that adventure, that unknown that uh, have the propensity to be lost by this massive emergence of technology at our fingertips. I certainly have reflected in some of those most amazing adventures I had were because of the lack of technology. I'll share one with you that actually... Yeah, please. I can, I can, there's a story brewing here. <laughs> yeah. One that, that was just before I went off to Antarctica. I had been to Argentina uh, previously, but hadn't necessarily done everything that I wanted to in terms of exploring it. And so said to my mom, who she and I have done many international travels together, I said, oh, how about we go to Argentina and spend, you know, a couple of weeks there together before I then head off and meet up with my study abroad colleagues um, to head off on the expedition. And she's like, yep, okay, sounds great. So off we went, knew we wanted to spend some time in Buenos Aires, hadn't spent a lot of time there, but hadn't fleshed out necessarily everything that we're going to be doing. Get into Buenos Aires and in chatting with people, realizing that actually the city really shuts down over Christmas there over the, the Christmas holiday period and said, oh, well, 
don't necessarily want to, you know, be in this massive city if it's going to be more or less everybody's off visiting families. And so we remember just chatting with some some locals and saying, well, if we were to go somewhere, where should we go? And they said, oh, go to Pinamar, beautiful coastal town on the Atlantic coast, you know, really easy sort of five hour drive from Buenos Aires. We had no idea anything about Pinamar. There was no smartphone in our hand to do a quick Google search and find accommodation or anything. It was literally just like, should we do it? So, yeah, okay. They recommended it. Okay, let's let's give it a go. Jumped online, booked some B and B. There's no reviews or anything. And yeah, it was literally the you know hotel computer that we did that on. Bought an Airbnb, picked up a hire car, and other than verbal directions that had been given us to us by the hire car company in terms of how we were going to get from Buenos Aires to Pinamar, that was all we had. My Spanish was pretty good back then it was you know could definitely get around and i'm really getting the five hour drive from buenos aires to pinamar was pulling over at random intervals on the side of the road and i would jump out and run into a service station and and ask if we were on the right road and what was our next turn and then away we would keep going so yeah we made it to pinamar you know probably a a bit longer than it would take you with with Google Maps in hand now. But probably the the most amazing bits were once we even got there to this beautiful coastal town, just really getting out and asking locals and exploring, getting them to say what to do. One of those was a couple that we met at the bed and breakfast said, oh, go into town Christmas Eve, you know, being a heavily Catholic faith-based country. Christmas Eve is the huge celebration. So go into town, find yourself a table. All the restaurants will be overflowing with families. But again, we didn't even know how to get from our bed and breakfast into town. If my father's listening to this, he's going to hear a story he's never heard to this day. So Fred Hand, brace yourself. (laughs) Mom and I hop into this little, what's in Australia called a buzz box, tiny little car uh, to drive. But there's no streetlights anywhere. We have no map. We've just got verbal directions from this couple who had a chat. And they told us to drive down the road and take the first right that we could. And that would take us down another road to to lead us into town. We followed those instructions, but there's no street lights. Car lights are are nominal. That first right turn was a sand road, which actually was a beach access road. And before we knew it, we had our little buzz box slammed into sort of the, the off the road into a bit of a sand dune. It's Christmas Eve. There's no, you know, Hertz roadside assistance going to be coming. And and we're just going, oh my gosh, you know, what, yeah, what's going to happen? Well, lovely family comes by, their big old pickup truck, some big Ford F-250 or something, proceed to get some ropes that they had, tie it around the back of our bumper and then snatch us out, then to the back of said rental car bumper, which we dealt with later on when we got back to Buenos Aires. And then they said, follow us into town. We'll, we'll get you to town. Ends up getting into town, though, and sitting down at this restaurant, being taken in by this lovely matriarch who had her extended family at the restaurant and proceed to spend the entire Christmas Eve well into the wee hours of Christmas Day celebrating with this family that we just met. Those sorts of things are not impossible nowadays, but with technology are much less likely to to happen. Maybe we didn't need to run into the sand dune and have to get towed out, but the whole adventure and certainly then ending up spending dinner with this you know, amazing family for their Christmas Eve wasn't something that would have happened if we had a pre-booked, you know, dinner seating for a Christmas Eve sit down at a restaurant. How lucky are we to have experienced that, yeah. right? That, that kind of moment in time where travel was easy, you know, you, the airlines and money exchange and all that stuff was was easy, but without actually that blockage of, yeah, I've got 15 minutes to wait for a bus, so I'm just going to sit here and scroll on my phone. You, you talk to people. Yeah. yeah. Huge privilege, isn't it? <laughs> Earlier on, you kind of briefly mentioned that you'd been studying journalism So maybe by way of sort of transitioning to talking about international ed, because obviously you're not a journalist, you you write very well, but you're not a journalist. So 
What happens to that path, so to speak? Focusing on magazine journalism was really focused at that's where my career is going to be going. I was, as I said, studying abroad, but that was very much a passion and enjoying the adventure it was, you know, credit towards my degree. But I wasn't doing international studies. I was minoring in Spanish, but again, very much is something that I saw that would, would help my career to have a second language, wasn't uh, pursuing international ed. I really was trying to expand my horizons within journalism, had an amazing early mentor in my career, Professor Conrad Fink, the the now late um, Conrad Fink. He had been the head of the Associated Press, the AP in Southeast Asia for much of his career before progressing to be a vice president of the Associated Press and then going on to be an esteemed professor in, in the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication. He took thousands of students during his tenure there under his wing. And I was fortunate to be one of those. And he provided a lot of opportunities. I got to do things like go to the Associated Press Institute in Reston, Virginia for intensives, which was very uncommon at the time for college students to be a part of. But one of the things that Fink, as he was known and still is known, just Fink. Like, you know, you've made it when you you know, you've just called by your last name. It's like Obama. <laughs> If you're listening to this, go Google him. His eyebrows spoke to you. He had these massive eyebrows and you'd sit down at his desk and he just, his eyebrows spoke to you and you knew what he was trying to convey just from, from sitting there and speaking to him. That That is incredible. Exactly. You just Chris, Google him, didn't you? Google, I have. Wow. Yeah. That's like John Howard on steroids. Like Exactly. Like, yeah, eyebrow <laughs> style. Good on him. I <laughs> Could you even grow any? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> he was, you know, again, providing opportunities, but also was really pushing the investigative journalism that I was doing, pushing me to, you know, write about things that were more challenging um, topics that were sometimes really, you know, in your face. And when I went to progress towards graduating and, and what's next, one of the things that I, I almost went and did, and in many ways I reflect on that, you know, this is where life takes us in different directions, is I always went and uh, served as an embedded war correspondent. At the time, the Iraq war was um, still happening. And that was one of the things that I considered doing, decided not to, and, and went for a much more conservative route. I worked at Coastal Living Magazine straight out of college. But I do think that the journalism foundations that I had, although I only worked in the journalism field directly for a short period of time, served a really good foundation in terms of a lot of the skills that I still utilize. So be that in the international student recruitment space, I then went on and and worked as an international student recruiter for, for many years. And it was around asking questions of students. So, you know, those skills of being a reporter actually transcended to sitting down with a student What are their aspirations? What are their goals? What are their passions? And then helping that in that counseling sense to to help shape their next steps. Uh, Similarly, nowadays, that translates a lot in terms of business development opportunities that I pursue, global engagement, partnerships, um, being able to ask those questions around what is it that the potential partner is seeking? What is it that might align to our goals as an institution? Certainly in that business development space, seeking out what are the, the capabilities that we have as an institution that might benefit a potential client or partner. And that's, you know, coming back to asking questions, seeking out information, but in a, in a different way than I probably uh, ever imagined. I imagine it's that kind of skill that, you know, you don't lose. And when somebody sort of hesitates mid-sentence or stops themselves and takes a different direction, you kind of notice it and you're like, oh, hang on a second. There's a thread there that I need to need to try and unravel. Yeah, I think it's that nature of wanting to ask questions, seek out what are opportunities Not every single one is one that you will end up pursuing, but many of those, just a bit more teasing out, can provide some really good opportunities. You can't afford to miss the Australian International Education Conference, happening from the 22nd to the 25th of October at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. AIC is the place to meet over 1,600 international education delegates from Australia and overseas. Build your own learning schedule, get insights from sector experts, new research findings and spark ideas at lively discussion sessions. Plus, there's plenty of networking opportunities, from the Expo Hall to brain dates and social events. Make sure you're at AIEC 2024 in Melbourne. Learn more at aiec.idp.com. So did you go straight out of college? What was your step, 
your sort of intermediate steps before you probably wisely decided not to become a war correspondent. We'd be sharing some very different stories at this point, I'm sure. But then did you end up in international? Yeah, so I had done a lot of work in the study abroad office while I was doing my degree, but it was very much a passion for me. It was, you know, not something that I I saw as a a career path and had been heavily involved both in formal, you know, part-time job opportunities as well as just volunteering opportunities to get out there and encourage more students to participate in study abroad. But off I went to work for Coastal Living Magazine, staying in touch with a lot of my mentors, both in the, the study abroad office as well as others, and out of nowhere get a call one day from two of my my mentors, Dr. Michael Tarrant and Dr. Utiara Chordre, who were heading up the studies abroad in the South Pacific office at the University of Georgia and said, hey, we're looking for a program coordinator. Your name keeps coming up. Are you interested? And one of them is going, oh, it's the global financial crisis. The magazine industry is being absolutely crumpled. I'm you know, still fresh out of college reality. I go and do this. And if it doesn't work out, I go back to magazine journalism, took that role uh, and originally was just a, you know, fixed term contract, go and do this program coordinator position. So that was my my first official role working in any capacity of international education. I think that kicked off in terms of my first official role in international education, but for me was the passion that I had always had around the benefits of international education, but realizing that it was actually a sector that you could make a career in and feeling really empowered by the impacts uh, that it has across individuals everywhere in the globe. When I introduced you at the start of the podcast, I said you're a superwoman because you you got, I mean, you do so much. You got kids, you got this great role, you were doing your MBA concurrently with all of that. I remember at some point just being like, how does Eleanor manage all of that? But just as you're talking around, you know, getting into international education, it was just making me think like, you've got this great business acumen. You're very sharp. Where did that come from? That's an interesting one. So uh, I guess part of it goes back to to childhood and I'll, I'll start with that and then things that I've learned since then. One of the things is my parents own and operate their own business. So growing up, sitting around the dinner table in the evenings was, yeah, how was your day? But then it was actually talking about what was the latest project that they were working on? Who was the next potential client? How was a, you know, construction, you know, progressing and having really robust discussions at, at a young age. That certainly, I think, set a lot of the the foundations in terms of just the, the business mindset, the entrepreneurial mindset that they both have. That was also then something that from a young age, I remember pocket money we made was always you had to be doing something. And my parents had a, a thermal fax machine, or if you remember the thermal fax machines, the big rolls, and the faxes would print out this massive long roll. And my dad would pay us a penny for every page that we cut. And then if we put the whole document together and stapled it, and you got paid by the, the pennies, and you have to keep up with, with how many pages of the thermal fax machine you, you cut and, and stapled for him. And so that certainly at a, a very young age instilled it. But then I think the... For me, it was always what were those passions that could be potential business opportunities. So my first business I ever had is probably one that will uh, shock you. Do you want want to take a gander at what my first business was? Well, I'm guessing in Georgia, it wasn't shoveling snow. No. (laughs) Uh, Lemonade stand. No, I don't know. My first business was a firewood business. Uh, So my maiden name is Hand, as in your hand. And so I named it Hand Split Firewood oh, that, and yeah. and would go to the, the family farms and split firewood to bring back into the, the city and, and smell, sell at strong prices to, to city folks needing firewood in the winters. But even that, I think, was some of them, of course, were just, you know, how to set up a, a business and, you know, basic accounts and things like that. But then also the the unforeseen risks that can come. And I'll, I'll tell you one that was definitely nothing that was in a, a business plan in terms of running a, a firewood business. And it happened to be that some friends from college had come along for the weekend to the farm. And so a number of people were around participating in my firewood business, uh, doing a bit of, bit of splitting. And we're doing, you know, splitting firewood, but also having a chat and everything whilst doing it. And uh, Ken and I were running the hydraulic splitter and other people were kind of helping stack wood. And Ken and I had a, a huge piece of a 
big old oak that had fallen in a tornado up against the hydraulic splitter and got stuck, which often it it can. And uh, he goes to dislodge it and was not paying enough attention and puts his hand on the hydraulics and did not have on his steel toe cap boots. And as he kicks off the piece of the wood, down comes the splitter and splits off his pinky toe and the one beside it. There might have been some of my sorority sisters there who screamed and were absolutely petrified of what had just transpired. Ken and I just threw him in the back of the the farm truck, grabbed those toes and away we went to the, the local medical center. Those are sorts of things that definitely are a different category of business acumen, the things that you need to think about that you don't necessarily think through when you're setting up a business. This explains why you are so on top of risk. <laughs> it's so true, isn't it? Hey, sorry, sorry, and I have to ask the obvious question. Did he, did he manage to get his toes reattached? No, he didn't. I asked to make up some sort of glamorous story about, you know, being up on Everest and stranded in the death zone and losing three toes to frostbite. No, so he, so he didn't, but it, it certainly is a, a story that's gone around the, the fire pit at the farm many, many times. You know, that's certainly the, the worst case scenario, but that business acumen, I think, is something that, again, then for me, it's around looking at those, you know, again, opportunities. And in universities, we've got extremely robust processes to consider any significant new business venture, but trying to have that mindset around if we've got an existing partner, it's not just a status quo. This is what we're doing with them. And that's, you know, that's the scope of it. It's around looking at, you know, what are other potential opportunities that we could be doing? Where could we expand this to to better the partner institution or expand what we have in terms of delivery with them? Also, what are other areas of the university that we might be able to bring in? So if we are just doing educational delivery is there something within the research space actually that we could be doing? Could we be doing capacity building? So that's, I think, for me where that that business acumen comes into play in terms of just looking for opportunities and, and growth as well. And and then absolutely, as you say, the the financials that come into play, the risk that comes into it, those definitely are are undercurrents. Would you run your own business again? Okay, I mean, it's like your, your your first sort of side hustle log splitting business, but would, would you do that again? I don't know. Maybe not chopping logs. <laughs> you now have three kids. Okay, let's let's admit that the demand for firewood in Brisbane probably isn't that high, but putting other people to work, at least you've got some, some people you could put to work. But yeah, just, just out of curiosity. Yeah, look, it's one of my, my two core things are passion and talent. So if you had asked me when I was, you know, Going into that first role as a program coordinator in the studies abroad in the South Pacific office, you know, do you want to be a, a director of international education um, for, and definitely not for uh, Australian university? That was that was nowhere in my my mindset at that point. But um, that wasn't a you know this is what I need to be doing. It was really around um, what am I passionate about and how can I be challenged. So those are the two really big guiding principles for me in terms of what's next. And I think that's one of the things um, I have to have conversations with some of my mentors around is it, it's a, a blessing and a curse. I think that for me, it's not, you know, I want to be a director for the next 10 years. And then after that, I want to go off and, and be in this position. It's very much could take a uh, career in, in many different ways, which I see is really exciting, but also doesn't mean it's a, a direct charted course. That's so true, isn't it? I think like life is fulfilling, as you've said, you know, like when you're at the edge of your comfort zone and you know something else is coming, you're not quite sure what it is, but if you just kind of remain curious and you're following the things you're interested in, you're passionate about, eventually that next thing just comes up and bites you, doesn't it? I think so. And I, I think part of it is having those continual conversations with quality mentors who can be those sounding boards as well. And that's something for me that's been really important in my career is is having a diverse range of mentors as well. So people who are in international education, but also those contacts who are actually well outside of it and can bring in perspectives. Sometimes we get a bit siloed in our way of thinking. So bringing in other ways um, of operating or 
you know, running businesses that helps. And I think that's something that I I try to to focus on and encourage others in terms of having those quality mentors and sounding boards that help us to process, but also provide some, you know, good advice or, or often not just necessarily advice, but perspectives of things that they've tried. How have they found you? Because it's obviously it goes both ways. Some of it's been deliberate and some I would say has been really organic. So biggest for me is being open to where either formal or informal mentors can come from, but using opportunities for informal discussions with with people as well. So I'll, I'll speak to mentors, but then also just around people who don't have to be an ongoing mentor, but ways that you can get some really useful insights from people. So in the mentor space, some it's been deliberate in terms of seeking out for me. Some of my mentors are female leaders who are 10 years my senior, so have uh, gone through similar challenges in their careers, particularly around raising a young family whilst um, having a, a demanding and progressing career. Other mentors are, are ones which, again, have been fortuitous, having the opportunity to, to sit down with someone and actually them saying, hey, look, you seem really keen and and like you've got a lot of opportunity. I'm really happy to have catch-ups with you if that's something that would be beneficial to you. So I think I, I've done a mixture of both and think that they've had benefits in both capacities. But the other one I would say are the opportunities for not necessarily an ongoing formal mentorship, but ways that you can glean some really effective insights from senior leaders or again, colleagues. And my my biggest one is around when you've got downtime with people, particularly in international education, a lot of it comes from planes, trains, automobiles, Ubers, you name it. And I find that if you've got that opportunity when you're sitting in, a, in an airport with someone, yes, we all have the times where you've got to smash out something or, or deal with an urgent report that's due. But invariably, the majority of people are really open to having a, a, a chat. Uh, so I take that as the opportunity of if I'm traveling with a senior leader and we're going to be sitting in an airport, using that as an opportunity to pick that individual's brains about something or just get their perspectives on how they might handle a situation. And I've gotten really good you know, perspectives and advice on things so much so that I'll, I'll share a, a funny one. I won't, won't say the individual's name. They might not uh, be happy to be called out, but um, traveling around South Asia for a couple of weeks with some senior leaders and I hadn't traveled with some of the individuals previously. And so you got to gauge how do people like to travel, you know, what are their preferences? And so one of the, the senior leaders was very clear up front. I won't be, you know, sitting together on on planes, that's my time, you know, see you guys on the other side. What he didn't know was that, of course, the travel team had got us all sitting next to each other on every single flight, including all of the internals all around, you know, India, Nepal, and other destinations. So from that first conversation around... I won't be sitting next to you. I I don't talk. I put on my headphones and I, I do my podcast. By the end of two weeks, I couldn't actually, if I had wanted to, gotten that individual to stop talking because really was actually more than happy and actually enjoying sharing a lot of his insights, his experiences, and very open to to sharing things that might be useful in terms of my leadership journey or challenges that I was facing within my my deliverables. Isn't it amazing? I mean, I, I think that's such a great example because people do want to share their knowledge and experience. We're flattered when we're asked for our advice on things. I remember the first time I spoke to a vice chancellor and said, oh, I'd like to, you know, I've got this idea for something. Can I just, uh, can I just put it to you and you tell me what you think? And being so intimidated, and, and this is Di Erbery, who was vice chancellor of Macquarie University, and she was just like, that sounds amazing. Like, awesome. Go do that. Like, 100% behind you. And I just walked, floated out of that conversation going like, wow. But I think we're just, we just we forget just how much being curious and asking a question can open doors and build relationships like that. And so I'd say now that senior leader isn't a, a formal mentor, not someone that I regularly am, am touching base with. But all I would have to do is, you know, shoot a text and say, "Hey, could I could I pick your brain on on something? This is the topic. Would appreciate you know ten to fifteen minutes of your time." And that individual, I feel really confident, would be more than happy to let me reach out. 
And how valuable is that? I, I think that's something that's that's really hard when you're early in your career, isn't it? It's like w- once you get further along, you're like, oh, I've got these people and everybody's moved up in their careers and you've got these great contacts. But you also end up in that position because you foster those relationships. You really, you know, you, you show curiosity and you respect the people you work with. And then suddenly you're like, oh, wow, well, I've got all these great people I can now reach out to for advice. You're a superwoman. Like you're incredible at managing your time, your career, kids, study. Can we talk about that just for a couple of minutes? Because it really is such a challenging nexus. Honestly, as a bloke engaged with my family and the like, but I still know that there's so much that I've missed from that journey. Even though I talk, I'm very close with my wife. Tell me about that. Like, how have you managed to navigate that balancing act? Like, you're killing it. You know, it just really, it looks like you've managed to seem, uh, juggling all these balls. Also easy. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely not an easy one. And I think one thing that I'm happy to be very candid about is whilst it, it seems like it's all, you know, well on track, there's so many times that it's not. I think it's really important, particularly for emerging female leaders who might having all of those different things that they're trying to, to you know, achieve. I think it's really important for emerging female leaders in particular to know that there's a lot of challenges and it's what might seem that it's all coming together really nicely. There's probably been lots of of hurdles and and challenges along the way. So really important to know that. I think for for me, uh, one thing that I am so grateful of is the the village that we have. So obviously I'm an American expat. I don't actually have any of my family living in Australia uh, and my my husband's family doesn't live uh, in Brisbane. They're interstate. So one of the things that I am so I guess passionate about is the fact that actually our village is a lot of people who have, have connections to international education. They don't work in international education, but when I take a step back and think through some of uh, my closest friends who are very much the village, one is a Malaysian who did her PhD in Australia and then decided to, to settle down and establish a very successful practice. Uh, another is uh, an American expat, but likewise, who did international education and is a very established uh, researcher here in Australia. Others had international experiences, either studies or living overseas, and they came back to Australia. And so we very much have linkages to to international and shared experiences and things. So one of my biggest ones is finding who your network can be. That can be people in the workplace, that can be family, that can be friends. And certainly for me, it's a lot of that village of when I'm going to be, you know, traveling overseas for a week, getting friends to do pickups of kids or childcare drop-offs to help out friends who know that I'm about to be away and do the lovely things of dropping off a pasta bake just to help out with household logistics whilst I'm traveling. So for me, that's been a, a huge component is is that network that enables me to do all of the things that, that I want to. And I think a lot of it also comes from other emerging uh, female leaders, again, in, in different, totally different sectors. But we try to support each other on that ability to raise young children and have a career that we're really passionate about and, and love and be able to have those components within our lives. What's the question you'd like to be asked on this topic? Even as a, a Westerner, like getting adjusted to a new country, which is something I think about a lot, like raising a family in a country that is foreign to you and what that I often think of as international students as well. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about it. Obviously, you've made the transition. My, my wife, you know, literally as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I've got, sure, I've got a bunch of my own questions, but, you know, there's also so much stuff that I don't know. So what is the question that, you know, I'm not thinking of, you know what I mean? But for me, a lot of it's around, you know, adjusting to, to even living in a yeah, another country and having to, to work out how to, yeah, the schooling system, the healthcare system, all of those sorts of things as well. Yeah, it's almost endless, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. You need two brains. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think there's certainly a lot of times where it's it's not just having two brains. Sometimes I feel like I've got multiple brains happening. But definitely at a time of, of having two brains was I was living in Australia, but I was doing international student recruitment. So I was a road warrior. I was gone. I was working for a third party provider. So there were no EBAs around how long you could be gone for. So I'd be gone for six months, eight months, and and very much living out of a, a suitcase. But 
one time when I was headed to, to North America to do recruitment, I remember getting into La Crosse, Wisconsin. So it's a small town in upstate Wisconsin, where the University of Wisconsin La Crosse is, is located. And gotten in late one evening and straight up the next morning to head out for info sessions and study abroad fair and, and the usual fanfare. But again, being a small town, got up, got out of my hotel, got into my rental car to drive you know, a few miles down the road to, to campus. And I'm driving down. It's a college town. It's, you know, I don't know, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, i.e. it's a desert. There's there's no one around. And I've made it probably halfway to campus and then realize that's really odd. Why is the stop sign on the other side of the road? Weird. It literally took me a a good 20 seconds when I stopped for the stop sign that's on the other side of the road to go, oh, I've been driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and thankfully it was a, a quiet early morning in a college town. But yeah, my brain was functioning as if I'm driving in Australia, hadn't switched back to, to being in America. I I knew my brain had actually then at that point started operating more in an Australian context, but it was one of those definitely, yeah, physical moments of how we have different brains and dropping in and out of those different brains, depending on what we're dealing with in a physical sense or in a a mental sense or in the the next, you know, latest challenge coming across um, your desk. I guess I also reflect on, I am, you know, grew up in an America culture, very similar to Australia in many ways. English is my first language. Mind you, I still find Australian words that I've never heard before. I just learned the word struth a few weeks ago. I had never heard struth before. But for me, that is something that still I am challenged with on a regular basis in terms of raising children in a country that I didn't grow up in. The healthcare system, I'm still regularly trying to get my head around how things work. The schooling system, you know, now looking at high schools for my my two older children, you know, all of that and how that works. I think it's one that we often don't give enough weight to the challenges in terms of be that international students, be that migrants. And it's really hard making new friends and figuring out healthcare systems and figuring out schooling systems. And I've been here you know, over a decade now, and I still find these things challenging. You think about our international students who are, you know, fresh into to the country and trying to figure out how things work. We've we've got to recognize that and make sure we've got so much wraparound support for them, which are really crucial in addition to the, their learning and teaching that they're doing on our campuses. I'm so glad you raised that as an example. It's the assumed knowledge, isn't it? And I mean, that's, that is about international and people coming from overseas, but it's actually just about dealing with humans in general. We put our assumptions, I'm actually going to write that on a little, I've got these like little index cards that are stuck up around my computer frame. I'm going to put that one on there because it's something you need to keep top of mind all the time when you're dealing with anybody. Just what is, what's the assumed knowledge that I'm projecting onto them that I can make this whole thing easier, better by not making an assumption. Oh, look, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Maybe, maybe just to finish up, to come back to international Ed, give me a bold prediction, a bold prediction about something that's going to happen in the next five or 10 years. Could be about institutions. It could be about AI. It could be about, take your pick. What, what, what's a bold prediction from Eleanor Mitchell? I think one of the things is that whilst we've got so much talk right now around artificial intelligence, the reality is much of what we as humans are focused around or connections. So while it's no doubt our international education and higher education lands forms are going to be transformed in the next five to 10 years with the use of, of technologies, AI, and, and many others, the reality I think is going to be that still those connections that we make in a classroom, in a study abroad program, in a fantastic onboarding for incoming international students are going to remain highly crucial for that quality student experience. Those are not going to get abolished by the creation of new AI that is going to absolutely enhance our international admissions and our recruitment and marketing processes, but it's not going to remove the fact that 
picking up an international student when they arrive at the airport in Port Macquarie and getting them into their student accommodation and telling them about the surf life-saving lessons that are going to be happening the following day for water safety. Those are the things that are still going to have a crucial impact in that overall student experience, but I think also that are going to continue linking us back as individuals to those connections we make. Amazing. Eleanor, thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a really fun chat. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.